Uh, hey everybody, thanks for coming to Drupal Community Events, how we've weathered the storm and what's on the other side. Uh, we have a lot to cover, so um, we're gonna ask folks to please hold your questions. We'll have Q&A at the end. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna say a lot of words. We will hopefully enunciate well. Uh, hey, that worked, cool. Uh, great, so um, on the panel today, uh, my name's Avi Schwab. Uh, I'm the project lead for MidCamp. Uh, I'm the board president of the event organizers working group, and I'm a technical product consultant for ImageX, a uh, full service agency. I'm Froboy on Drupal.org and AJ Schwab on Twitter because Froboy is squatting on that name for a long time. Uh, Leslie, go ahead. Hi, I'm Leslie Glenn. I'm the organizer of Design for Drupal Boston. I also work on the Net New England Drupal Camp organizing team. Um, I am the vice president of the event organizers working group. I'm le helping lead the project browser initiative and um, I do project management and customer support for Redfin Solutions up in Portland, Maine. So I came from Portland to Portland. So welcome, <laughs> thanks for coming, April. Hi, I'm April Sides. I'm the human in the picture, not the cat. Um, <laughs> I am a director <laughs> of Drupal Camp Asheville a uh, member of the Drupal CWG community health team. That's the community working group. Um, I'm also on a team for a virtual meetup about accessibility called Alley Talks. And I'm a senior software engineer at Red Hat. I am week before next, which is now. Cool. Um, my name is Matthew Saunders. I am the uh, director of Drupal Camp Colorado, which is the longest um, uh, running um, camp uh, continuously at this point. Um, it started in uh, 2007. Um, I'm a board member on the events organizing working group um, and, uh, and helped uh, found it. Um, for, uh, and uh, I'm also the board chair for Drupal Colorado Incorporated, a new nonprofit that was set up to support our camp. Um, and during the daytime, I'm a senior, I don't know why it says senior director. I'm a senior manager at Pfizer, not a senior director. I'm not sure how that happened, but I'd like to be a senior director. That would be good. <laughs> um, I, I manage a bunch of, uh, a bunch of uh, um, agile squads, 12 of them, um, along, with, uh, with, uh, along with three other um, um, colleagues. Cool. Uh, that's us. So um, as we've said, we are all part of the event organizer working group. Uh, the Event Organizer Working Group, or EOWG, uh, started in 2018. Uh, we, we were officially chartered in 2019. Um, there's a blog post uh, on the Event Organizers page on Drupal.org that has a lot of uh, a lot of information about how we started. But it was kind of we 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 had a number of conversations at DrupalCons uh, that that all kind of went back to growing this group of event organizers, and then we. We decided to, to kind of um, make it official. So Leslie's going to talk about our, our initiatives. Yep. So our mission is to support uh, community-led events um, to grow Drupal uh, through those events. So that's the real mission, to, to grow the adoption of Drupal through local events. Uh, the events include camps, meetups, uh, contribution days, sprints, training. So any, any way that you get together, um, to talk Drupal, any Drupal event is considered part of uh, what the event organizer working group, um, you know, is is interested in. Um, we focus on producing documentation and services that will help all of the different events use that information. Whether you're starting up a new event or you're a seasoned, um, you know, been doing events for a long time, we hope to provide information to help all of those events, and we certainly solicit all your input into that. Uh, we have three major initiatives going on uh, last year and through this year. One is the event platform, that is to create uh, a way for you to easily spin up databases for your event, uh, not sorry, spin up a website for your event uh, without having to do that from scratch. So that's the event platform. We also have the event information initiative. I don't know if you've seen the uh, page on drupal.org slash community slash events. That's where all events are listed, all the events that I just mentioned, including meetups and contribution days and all those things, including camps, are listed on the community slash events page. If your event isn't there, you should add your event there because that is the, the source that we're going to be using to move information across the Drupal community. Um, the third one is getting started in Drupal. That initiative is kind of like 
to, it's not really how to, how to start using Drupal, it's why you should use Drupal. It's more leaning on the Promote Drupal initiative. So it's a way for camps to have a session to say why, you know, you came to this camp or whatever it w why it might be. Why did you come, why would you adopt Drupal? What are the reasons? What, what are the great things about Drupal? How is it used? Things like, things of that nature. So that's what the Getting Started with Drupal initiative. We can use help from event organizers on all of these initiatives, so reach out to us. Um, real quick, one other thing. We have a monthly call. We have a board meeting, but then we have a monthly call on the second Tuesday of the month at 9 a.m. Eastern. We'd love everybody to join that call whenever you can. We also have a quarterly um, asynchronous meeting on Slack, so if you're not able to join, if 9 a.m. Eastern isn't a good time for you, join the quarterly Slack meeting and just, um, you know, communicate, you know, contribute, give us your ideas through that method. We have a newsletter, so sign up for that, and then we have a Slack channel. So there's many ways for you to get involved. We don't have a lot of participation right now from global events and, and other events, so please reach out, join our group. The goal is to get information from you to share with other events and for us to share information with all of you. Thanks, Leslie. So uh, we're going to take you through uh, a number of things. As, I, as, as, as we said, uh, this talk is kind of about how events have, have weathered the pandemic of the last couple of years and, and what we're doing moving forward. So uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is, is COVID and, and how camps have dealt with that. Um, yeah. yeah, so uh, so a global pandemic, you know, new, new event organizer challenge, right? <laughs> Um, we learned a lot about uh, contract lang language with our venues. If anybody had contracts in the year of 2020, um, we learned what force majeure means and knowing to look that, uh, that you can get out of your contract by those sorts of things, an act of God. Um, otherwise, you would lose your deposit and things like that. So good thing if you're, if you're doing an in-person event to start looking at your agreements in that way. Um, and as far as like, like what COVID protocols you should follow for your event, um, you can always start with the venue guidelines. Like a lot of, uh, if you're in a university, anywhere you are, they're gonna have a baseline guideline that they have to follow for their facilities. And then if you think that that's not good enough or whatever, you can add on to that, but it's a good baseline. Um, and, and you can always uh, try to provide masks and hand sanitizer as DrupalCon has done. Um, you can even see it here on the table, um, just making it easier for people to comply because we don't want to exclude people on purpose, right? Um, thinking about ways to communicate, you know, what happens when someone gets COVID during or after the event? Do you tell them, you know, in your policy, like, let us know so that we can let people know that there was someone. We won't name names because that's not you know, appropriate, but I think it's important for people to know and be able to assess their risk. And you know, if they go home from the event and they know there was someone there that they may have been in contact with, then they can test, they can not visit people who are immuno immunocompromised and their family and things like that and just allow them to make better choices for themselves and their families. Um, and thinking about like uh, social activities or I mean, I don't know, you could even do a camp outside if you really wanted to. Um, if it's not too hot, not too cold, and I get it rained on. Um, we with actually the did that one year in Colorado. We did it up uh, up in one of the uh, oh, national parks, nice. and it was nice. kind of fun. Wow. Yeah. So thinking out of the box and uh, <laughs> making your event a little bit safer with the open outdoors. Um, as far as new normal, um, you know, like when I'm doing Drupal Camp Asheville stuff, you know, I'm monitoring local data. I'm trying to keep up to date on what's going on in my area. Um, and just thinking about the fact that there are treatments more widely available now. Um, to prevent death and hospital overload. Um, so, and those things should continue to improve. Um, hopefully we're, we're on our way to an area where we don't have to think about this quite as, as you know, right in front of us as we do right now. Um, and just communication is key. You know, enc encouraging folks to manage the risk and protect their most valuable uh, loved ones and being very respectful of people's uh, risk management decisions along the way. Yeah, not, a, not everybody can, can or wants to get vaccinated, right? So we need to look at all kinds of different ways that we can, that we can accommodate folks, whether it's masking or, or, uh, or distancing, uh, making testing easy, uh, and so on. But I think it's super important that we respect other people's, people's points of view and decisions. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think if anything, that the last couple of years have taught us that, and, and especially coming back here, have, have, have shown that, 
you know, we're, we're going to be dealing with things like this f I, for for a while. I think I think dealing dealing with you know disruptions in in the world is going to be the new normal, and 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 yeah, I think I think we're all kind of figuring out how we can deal with that. You know, and one thing that you might want to consider if uh, if you don't want to do a social like outside, for example, is maybe you rent the rent a a place. You know, the the uh, an entire room or something like that. So you've got a little bit more control of who's coming and who's going. Um, I don't know about you, but I feel a little bit uncomfortable being in in a in a bar where I don't really know whether whether the people are are uh, um, following the same kinds of same kinds of protocols that I am, but if we if you've got a good policy for the camp, and uh, and uh, you you feel pretty pretty confident that people are following that policy, it's probably okay to get a bunch of people into a into those people into a room, right? Yeah, and I was just going to say, don't feel pressure to have to go back in person because because all the you know a lot of other camps are. If you don't feel comfortable in your area, might not be as you know. Uh, they might have more cases or whatever. Don't feel that pressure. It's fine to still stay virtual for another word. Design for Drupal, we're staying virtual for another year. A venue is too expensive to take the risk of not being able to um, have enough people come to pay for it. So don't feel that pressure. Just uh, do what's right for you and for your community. Right. Yeah, and I mean, and, and that's 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 a big part of what we we're we're trying to do with the event organizers working group. Um, it's it's not make Drupal events consistent. It's provide consistent resources for each event to be its own thing. So we, you know, um, every every event needs to needs to make that decision themselves. Should we go to the next one? Yeah. Cool. Uh, so the next kind of section uh, we want to talk about is content delivery. Um, so this is this is kind of we 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 brainstormed a ton of of things to talk about here, um, and and you know when we pivoted to virtual. Um, one of the things we, we, we needed to think about was was how we're going to do these virtual events. Um, so you know the 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 in the beginning of the pandemic the the question was was obvious. We we're not doing virtual events, right? Uh, and uh, and we pretty quickly had to figure out um, how how to move forward. Uh, so with Midcamp in 2020, um, you know uh, Midcamp 2020 was scheduled for March. I don't know the dates. The, the third week in March of 2020. Uh, so so we pivoted from uh, you know uh, an event that we had spent nine months planning uh, for for an in-person event. We pivoted that to virtual in less than two weeks, uh, and <laughs> that was it was a great time. Uh, but looking back on it, I was I was telling somebody yesterday, you know, most of those were technical problems, right? It was just we have speakers, we have um, content. We had every, you know, we'd sold tickets already. We had everything already done. Uh, we just had to figure out how to use Zoom, which two years ago took took a lot of work. Uh, you know, we, we we had a bunch of people and we threw them at the problem of of getting speakers to do their sessions on Zoom, and uh, and it worked, and it was it was fine. Um, you know, in in 2021, um, after a year of everybody doing virtual conferences, we we kind of decided to rethink um, what we were doing, right? Uh, you know, in March of 2021, nobody wanted to sit on Zoom for another hour, let alone <laughs> three days. Uh, so, uh, you know, there was a lot of fatigue, uh, in, in, in the organizers as well, um, just kind of in the middle of the pandemic, none of us wanted to go through that whole process again. Um, so, so we, uh, you know, in 2021, we, we tried to make the event um, more engaging. Uh, we, we reduced the amount of kind of pre-prepared content and tried to, um, tried to bring people in for, for an unconference style uh, event online. Uh, I think we did a really great job. Uh, a number of our organizers did a ton of work to, to think about, you know, how, how an unconference with post-it notes and boards and, and discussion tables would, would look in an online format. Uh, you know, and it was really hard because getting uh, the part of part of uh, unconference and, and part of engaging in real life is 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 being present, uh, right? And and one of the things that I learned about virtual conferences is that it's really hard to be present for for three days when you're working from home and attending a conference from home. 
Uh, and so, so we had to kind of grapple with um, wanting to engage people, but also, you know, knowing that they, they had pretty limited um, abilities to, to engage. Um, and it was hard, but, uh, but you know, I think, again, we, we, we kind of did some really interesting stuff there. Um, there, there, you know, there, there are even more questions around scheduling. Um, even before the pandemic, we had been um, trying to kind of figure out the best place for uh, a, a camp in the week, uh, wanting to balance the fact that most of us are getting paid to do Drupal now, and it's not just our, our side hobby. Um, so we, so we want to, um, you know, we want to not take up people's personal time with doing work stuff, and, and we know a lot of people are, are not wanting to do that now. Um, but we also wanted to provide an opportunity for, um, for people who were just getting started and who might have a full-time job that isn't Drupal to, to be able to get involved. Um, yeah, um, other, other things. Um, you know, trying to think about half days, uh, so, so to make shorter chunks of time that we were doing conferences. Um, having meetups during lunch hours is something that we've talked about. Um, just, you know, as we move forward, um, the pandemic and the kind of changing landscape of, of Drupal uh, and, and our jobs, I, I think, is forcing us to continually rethink how we engage people. And for our camp, we, we, we decided that we we're going to use Hopin after we saw the, uh, the association um, use it so successfully. Um, and what we discovered uh, pretty quickly was the same patterns that we had in place for the camp in person um, were easily replicable in an online format. In fact, we, we, uh, we named the rooms the same kinds of things that we name rooms um, in our physical space. What we did discover um, by attending camps um, uh, online was that nobody wanted to do a full day. We'd gone to, a group of us had gone to different camps where they had tried a full day online and it was exhausting. So we reduced our, our, uh, our uh, uh, length of the day to a half day. Um, and we made sure that we had some social things that went on so it wasn't just talking heads. Like we played games and, and enjoyed each other's company um, as well at the same time. This year, we've decided that we're going to try to do it hybrid. Um, and one of the reasons that we've tr decided that we're going to do that is that um, over the last two years, we managed to pull in an international um, audience, which had never really happened before. Um, and, and uh, um, you know, we might have a smattering of people, one or two people from, from, uh, from out of country, quite a few people in contiguous states. But we'd never had a situation where we had speakers from India and, and from all over Europe. Um, it put us in a position where, where uh, uh, Rachel uh, Lawson was able to do some interviews for us. And, like, it was really compelling. And um, when, we, when we polled our community, they said, uh, we don't want you to just go back pers in person completely. We want, we want this, kind of, this kind of content that, uh, that you've been, been able to pull in. So knock on wood, um, our venue's internet is going is to uh, be able to handle uh, uh, live streaming. We're hoping so. Um, and uh, we're planning on doing a little bit of testing uh, prior to our camp in August. Nice. And I think the format of the camps has changed uh, since We've been doing them virtually. So I w I'm involved with one camp that went to all birds of a feather sessions. Um, another camp um, has a keynote and a contribution day. One day we were a three-day camp, and then we have webinars across the rest of the, of the year. So there are different ways to, to think about how you present your camp, e if it's in person or still virtual. It doesn't have to be a full day of sessions. There's many other options you can, you can choose from. Yeah, so we, we used Hopin as well, and we did social events in Zoom. We did trainings through Zoom, um, so we kept a similar format. Um, the, the things I'm thinking about with, with hybrid being a little bit tricky is that you probably need a bigger team, or you need two teams, like a dedicated team for supporting those who are, are not there in person and someone to our teams to, to handle the, the in-person, and then probably like a dedicated internet connection or a hard line so that it's separate from the Wi-Fi, because that, that'll be tricky. Um, but I think that virtual events do have an audience, and it may be a little bit different than the in-person camps. Like, they are highly focused on getting value from sessions. Um, they, they can't attend in-person events at all just for a myriad of reasons. Um, 
And there are some people who are more comfortable even giving sessions and speaking at virtual events. So think about those kinds of things. Um, and I think that, that we've seen now that there's an opportunity for uh, new event organizers. Maybe you, you can't organize a local event. You don't think that would be successful. You could do global internet events. I mean, it's, or, you know, online only events. I mean, we see this in other technology spaces as well. Um, this, this is an opportunity. And I think for, for us anyway, it was less expensive to do an online event, like, you know, financially. So you can get some sponsors. You don't, you don't need that much money or that many sponsors to do the virtual event. Yeah, I mean, and the, the one other thing that came up in the community summit yesterday um, is that, uh, you know, the, the, when we started doing events, Matthew, 14 years ago, you said. Yeah. <laughs> this is our 15th uh, year, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, the, it, was, it was really hard to, to, to get content about Drupal uh, online, and, and so camps were, were the, you know, the place that people came uh, outside of DrupalCon to, to learn about Drupal. Uh, now we have Drupal.tv, which is a huge repository of, of thousands of videos that have been produced at, at camps and events across the world. Uh, we have the DrupalCon, you know, video library. Um, there's there's tons of resources out there now um, that that produce content all the time, and so. Um, using camps uh, and, and meetups as a way to, to, to engage people more, uh, I, I think to me is, is, is even more important than, than that learning, um, right? So yeah, so we can talk about that some more. Uh, okay, next up, uh, Matthew's gonna talk about nonprofits. Yeah, so, so um, Drupal Camp Colorado um, over the years has tried to, um, uh, create a nonprofit uh, three times now, um, and um, this this last time, the third time was a charm. Um, and one of the reasons that we we decided that we wanted to do that was we needed in two thousand two thousand thirteen we got big enough that we needed a formal entity to m handle our money. We weren't in a position where anybody was comfortable having that money in somebody individual's uh, uh, bank account, um, and we didn't want to store it under somebody's mattress either. Um, so in 2013, we, uh, we approached the Open Media Foundation, who set up a fiscal sponsor relationship with us. And that, that was really good until, again, we got to a point where we were large enough where we needed to be much more nimble um, around being able to make payments and so on. Um, so so, uh, so this, past, uh, this past year, during the pandemic, um, a bunch of us said, hey, Let's let's just let's just figure out how we how we make it happen this time. Now the trick for us was the first two times we tried to do all of the paperwork on our own. That is daunting. Don't ever do that. Um, um, so we we worked with a, a company called the Company Corporation, um, who who took care of all of our initial um, initial paperwork for um, for filing the articles of incorporation, and then worked uh, handed us off to a, a an organization that they work with that specifically manages running uh, a corporation through uh, the 501c3 process. And what they told us was, you know, it could be six, eight months. You may well have a situation where, where lots of questions are going to come back from the IRS because we're doing the short form version of this. Um, and what ended up happening when, when we went through our, our, uh, our conversations with this, with this consultant was they came back and they said, wow. You, you guys actually really know what your, your mission is. You really know what your vision is. And we're like, well, yeah, we've been doing it for 14 years. Um, and the IRS came back in two months, um, didn't ask us a single question, uh, and we got our exemption letter. Um, I, I, would, I, would, I would strongly recommend if you as a camp are thinking about, uh, about uh, um, um, forming your own nonprofit, again, don't do it yourself. Uh, it cost us. It cost us about twelve hundred bucks, and I can tell you from ha trying to do it twice before, um, the time that it was taking us was, you know, the value of that time was way, way, way more than twelve hundred bucks. Um, so yeah, um, we can now uh, issue um, um, uh, letters. You know, when when you donate, we can give you a tax uh, a tax deduction, and we're pretty pretty stoked about it. We did it ourselves. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, no, I, I, and I would recommend Matthew's approach. 
<laughs> uh, no, uh, so so Midcamp was kind of in the same boat uh, a few years ago, and we decided to create the Midwest Open Source Alliance, uh, MOSA. Um, so yeah, like I said, we we did uh, did all the paperwork ourselves, uh, both to incorporate as a Illinois and a in a federal nonprofit. Uh, and that's been, you know, it, it was a lot of work to start, and we we had kind of tossed it back and forth for a number of years, um, but it's been great. And so we're we're using MOSA as an umbrella organization for uh, a couple other camps, um, uh, MWDS and Twin Cities. Uh, so that's uh, it's worked pretty well so far. You know, we've kept it relatively small, um, but incorporating on our own has uh, given us, uh, as Matthew said, some some advantages. Um, you know, stuff like having our own bank accounts, uh, having our own, you know, tax exempt letter uh, to be able to give to restaurants or, or venues or whoever um, that, that, that we own that's not somebody else's. Um, it's, it's been really nice. Uh, also just being able to, to get um, uh, other services. So, so we have a Google workspace that's free because yeah. we have an EIN, we have a, a paid Slack, we have a, we have a, you know, a paid Slack that we, that we got for free uh, being a nonprofit. Um, there, there are other services that that you can get um, that you can get uh, by like being a community organization or being an open source organization. Uh, but some of the bigger ones, like Google and Slack, are really just like, do you have an EIN that you haven't used that somebody else hasn't used yet? Yes or no? Uh, and and by having our own EIN, we were able to get into some of those. Great. Yeah. The other thing is, uh, if you've got a nonprofit set up, you can actually apply for grants, um, which you can't do if uh, if you uh, if you don't have have that status. Um, so there are, there are federal grants, there are state grants, local grants where you can actually get a little bit of cash to do something special that you hadn't uh, that you know that you might not have been able to do through through individual or or uh, or, or company uh, sponsorships. Right. And one other quick thing, we didn't have a lot of time to do any of that, so Nerd Summit is another one similar to what Avi was talking about. They exist as a nonprofit, and they just took on some other camps um, as, you know, under their nonprofit. So we just go to them, and they give us whatever paperwork we need. So that's another option as well. If, you don't, if you're a small camp and you don't have the time to go and do everything that uh, it takes to create your own nonprofit. Yeah, and there's another option. We actually didn't have to transfer during COVID. We were already on a platform called Open Collective, and our fiscal sponsor is Open Collective Foundation. And you can apply online, and they have an online uh, all set up for accepting donations. You can even sell tickets on there. It's not uh, super flashy, but um, you can submit an application. Our, you know, the the event the events that we run are in line with their mission, and so it's it's pretty quick approval. Um, they're very responsive as a team. Um, you can actually get a free G Suite domain account through them. Um, you can get virtual credit cards based on your budget and balance, so that makes purchasing things a lot easier. Um, the platform's fairly easy to use, and they will automatically send emails thanking um, donors and send receipts. And they also are starting to provide more educational support on you know, helping us to fundraise and, and build communities and things like that. One thing I learned yesterday, Monday. One thing I learned this week <laughs> too is that you you can um, you can also use Open Collective uh, and still have your own uh, EIN, uh, your own tax tax exemption uh, stuff. Uh, so Open Collective provides a ton of resources that you don't you don't have to use them as the fiscal agent for. Right. The the way that the payment happens is they take a little percentage, like a five percent of your your income. So when people buy tickets, when sponsors sponsor, there's just a, a cut taken out. And then if, I think if you use the platform, there's a, a small chunk as well. So, yeah. yeah. But I think it's, it's well worth it for sure. Yeah, definitely. Uh, okay, cool. Moving on. Um, next up, we're going to talk about supporting services. So, so as I said, um, the event organizer working group uh, kind of kind of stemmed out of uh, a lot of us trying to stop uh, reinventing the wheel for every event. Um, we are continually trying to build support services um, for events uh, with the aim of, of, of continually enabling events um, and, and, and growing the Drupal um, ecosystem and space and contributors and, and training new people and bringing new people in. Um, so a couple of things that we've been working on um, so far. Um, the first is a, 
is code of conduct contact training. I'll let April talk a little bit. Yeah, so this is something that I, I work on through the community working group. Um, so there's a page on Drupal.org under the community working group code called code of conduct contact training. See that three times fast. Um, so what is a code of conduct contact? It's, um, a, you know, finding a few diverse people that will be the contact if somebody needs to say that something happened that was not in line with the code of conduct. Um, they can help mediate and help resolve things like that. Um, so having this training helps those folks know what to do whenever someone has a problem at the camp. Um, so it's a great way to contribute without giving back code. Um, once you do the training, you'll be listed on the website so that uh, organizers, so as, you know, as event organizers, you can go to the website and see who has taken the training and who to contact and maybe offer a free ticket or something like that as an incentive for them to come and help you with your event. Because as an organizing team, that's one more thing you have to put your energies towards. And it's a kind of a nice thing to have someone who's gone through the training uh, be able to do that for you. Um, so the trainings that we're doing right now are through Otter Tech. Um, they happen generally once a month. We've got all the dates on there. There are also events in the community events um, part of Drupal.org. Uh, the workshop cost is $350, but there is a $50 discount if you uh, submit a form on the page that tells you all about it. If you want, if you want the link, just let me know. Um, but yeah, you can. You'll after completion, you'll be listed. You'll get a checkbox on your profile that you completed the training. Um, yeah. Yeah. So those yeah those trainings are fantastic. Um, if, even if you are, are, are involved in events outside of Drupal, um, it's really, really worth doing or sending somebody to. Um, they're, they're, it's, they're incredibly facilitated. Um, in, yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say, for, for our camp, anybody that wants to take the, uh, who's on the organizing committee, who wants to take the training can take the training. Um, we, uh, uh, we have encouraged it. Uh, um, I, I actually think even if you don't end up becoming um, a contact for a camp, understanding um, what uh, what the training is about, um, I think helps a ton in just sort of conceptualizing what could happen. Um, and I think it can also help you approach people in a different way than you would in a more inclusive um, way than you than you might have before taking the training. I thought it was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, and um, MidCamp's been also funding anybody on our team um, who wants to take the training. Uh, and if there's anybody from uh, an, another event uh, who, who doesn't have funding to, to send folks, um, talk to me, we can, we can probably help you out. Um, another thing that, that we, um, with the CWG, have been, um, have been working on is, uh, is accessibility playbook. Uh, this is pretty new, uh, it was just put together a year ago, six yeah. months ago. Um, this is this is something that stemmed out of um, a few events uh, that that happened at um, at a camp, and uh, with with the intent of of mitigating risk. Um, so we, uh, you know, in, in running events, um, you know, we're, we're we're doing a ton. We're we're taking a lot of, of work on, uh, but there's also some liability, right? And and in um, in trying to run events and trying to provide accessibility, um, there, there's always the possibility that, that um, you know, your, your efforts may not be considered enough and somebody might want to, um, you know, take some action. Um, so the, the, the goal of the accessibility playbook is to help events um, have some language around um, what they, they, they can and cannot provide in terms of accessibility. Again, it's a playbook. It's not, it's not a, a rigid set of guidelines. It's, it's a, a number of resources that help you form your own, um, your own language around accessibility. So, um, you know, we, we, we all know that, that we're, we're all trying to do our best um, to provide accessibility, but, but um, you know, just like anything else, uh, accessibility is kind of an endless sink of, of things that, that are possible, right? You, there, there's no like 100% accessibility um, when it comes to, to humans, right? And, and so um, knowing what you can and can't do, um, being able to uh, provide timelines, right? To say like, we really wanna help and we really wanna make this the most accessible event possible, but 
if you come to us like a day before, we're probably not going to be able to get you a you know a, a human sign language interpreter. Um, th things like that uh, are are important to kind of help um, help help make your event better and, and reduce the liability for your team. Yeah. So as Matthew said, um, <clears throat> it's a it's a a lot of information for you to be able to understand, better understand what, you know, you should be providing in terms of accessibility. You know, somebody may not come up to you specifically and ask for something, but this will give you information for you to think about, you know, maybe I should be trying to provide this. And then what you put on your website in terms of language for how you're going, you know, what you plan on providing at your camper event, the, the, the um, accessibility playbook will help you with that as well, so you don't have to come up with that. Um, you know, on your own. Yeah. Um, I'm going to roll through this and then we've got yep. Q&A. Uh, so yeah, the last thing is documentation. Um, we've worked uh, for a long time uh, on, on playbooks for a lot of different things around camp organizing uh, and event organizing. Uh, and they've all um, been put together by the amazing, incredible uh, documentation team. Uh, so if you look on, uh, I lost the link, but um, on the Drupal, um, documentation repo on drupal.org. Uh, there's a whole set of events organizing stuff. Uh, I, I made a short link, uh, mid.camp slash events dash docs. Um, but uh, yeah, you can find that and, and we'll, we'll put some more links out about that. Uh, yeah, so, so those are the things. Um, uh, we're gonna do Q&A. Uh, as Leslie, sla Leslie said, we've got a number of things going on uh, today around, ooh, thanks. Uh, event organizing. Uh, so we have a BOF today at 2.30. Uh, you can join that to come talk more about events. Uh, we also have a table in the exhibit hall, uh, 6.30, 6.35, um, in towards the back of the exhibit hall, come there. Uh, we've got a ton of event uh, stickers, swag, hats, um, and then uh, we also encourage you to join the event organizers working group. Uh, if you organize events or are interested in organizing events, uh, we'd love to have more help kind of growing this team. Uh, so with that, um, we'll take questions. We'll try and repeat the questions and, uh, and give you some answers. Well, you can raise a hand. Everything. Somebody's <laughs> gotta have a question. No? Yes. So, uh, hi, my name is Jessica. I'm one of the co-organizers for uh, Drupal GovCon. We've gone virtual the last two years. We're still trying to figure out what's going to happen this year. And we lost access to our space, and um, we're a free event, which means we don't collect a lot of income other than through sponsors, and the DC area is very expensive um, to rent from. But I'm curious about Colorado and how you're doing. We, too, received a lot of feedback, especially with government being a big part of our community, which is not just in DC about how they really appreciated, you know, access and that would hopefully keep us virtual. But balancing the, ha are you, the renting of this space, the number of volunteers for the space and online, how are you tackling that? So yeah. we- Matthew, I'll uh, repeat the question. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so, go yeah, ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, so Jessica from GovCon asked um, how Colorado is planning on balancing um, all of the things that they need to do to, to do a hybrid event with, with both virtual and in-person. So I'll start with the money part first. Um, um, so over the last couple of years, we have added a sponsorship, which is our hop-in sponsorship, right? So we're in a position where people can sponsor the camp um, uh, in the, the normal sort of platinum, gold, bronze kind of, uh, kind of uh, way still. But we added that hop-in sponsorship because we knew that we were going to need some peoples who are willing to help us uh, um, uh, ensure that the that there was live streaming going on? We were super lucky that we've got a, a a college campus that we've been working with for, gosh, probably probably ten years, um, where where we've got an excellent space for the for the camp itself. And when we said that we wanted to come back this year, they were just thrilled. Like they were just like, "Yep, that's great." And uh, uh, they, in fact, this year gave us a little bit of a discount as well because we got that 501c3 status. So it means that we can become a partner of the university, which we couldn't do in the past. 
um, to, to, to what April was talking about just, um, just a little bit ago, we also have access to hardwires, which, um, which is going to make things a whole lot easier for us to ensure that, uh, that we, we actually can, in the major spaces at least, um, uh, be able to, to uh, um, um, run, run computers that aren't having to worry about spotty Wi-Fi and so, so on. Um, uh, we haven't figured this out though yet, right? <laughs> we're 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 in the midst of 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 sorting out how we're going to do all of these things, but it feels like because we didn't change our format from 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 live to virtual, it feels like what we're going to need to be figuring out mostly is the technical piece of it, and we're a bunch of nerds. We can figure that out. You're going to say, Matthew, I'm looking forward to your session at the next DrupalCon about how you went hybrid with your event. <laughs> <laughs> and the mess that it was, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, image, oh, sorry, the one, one other thing I'll say about, about uh, that. The one thing that I've tried to do at MidCamp for a while that, that uh, has been hard, but has been trying to encourage uh, agencies or companies to, um, to, to sponsor the event with people, with resources. Uh, I haven't gotten any hits yet, but um, offering in-kind sponsorship or even more, you know, trying to trying to um, trying to get people to you know to resource humans like and that's that's always been you know a thing that we've needed. That's that's totally fair, I mean, and and the way that we structured our camp. Um, we decided this in a number of years ago. Uh, you know, we get corporate sponsors like from agencies and so forth, but we also encourage um, individuals who can afford to do it to, to sponsor us on, a, on an individual basis, which means that we've been uh, been for you know the last 10 years or so, whomever can't afford to, to pay, they don't have to pay. Um, we, we, we want people to be able to, to, uh, to access the camp. But our, our individual sponsorships um, you know, from from people, have they've all been, always been incredibly generous. Um, we've been very very lucky, and it, it's meant that we've been able to put ourselves in a position position where we've got a little bit of a cash reserve. Um, and I know a lot of camps aren't necessarily in that situation where they've got a little bit of money set aside every year that they can use to prime the pump the next year for the camp. Um, but we've been super 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 lucky, and in fact, our our our, our uh, income went up when we made the camp free. <laughs> uh, Imogen. Well, I helped organize four of the people camp, and we had one virtual session this year, basically it was Zoom. And then I went to an accessibility conference um, back in November, and it was all hybrid with no platform. And again, people were presenting their stuff through Zoom, and the website had a button if you were coming in virtually. Here's your Zoom link. So it was very low bar, mm -hmm. low technology, and just adding that link. And it did have a snafu, but it was an easy way for either a virtual presenter to dial in or for the audience to dial in if they were remote. Yeah, so just to repeat that for the recording, um, Amy June from Bad Camp, um, Amy June. Sorry. Florida camp, sorry, Amy June from everywhere camp, uh, <laughs> said, uh, you know, she, they, Florida leveraged some really low tech solutions to, uh, to, to going hybrid. Uh, so just, you know, having Zoom or, or having, um, you know, some, 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 some low tech solutions that um, aren't foolproof, but, but still provide some level of hybridness can help. Um, yeah, we're, we don't have another session starting in the room. Um, we've just got lunch, so I think we can, have a couple more questions if anybody has. If nobody yeah. else does. All right, Jessica, go for it. Yeah. So one of the challenges that we've had, uh, especially since our event is so large, is the volume of volunteers to, to pick from. People get burned out. And I find that one of the things that is a challenge for us is that when we do get someone onboarding that person and being able to explain to them all of the duties of the person who did it before, has the working group considered um, or is thinking about maybe documenting key, posi key volunteer positions that we could reuse? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so Jessica from GovCon asked, uh, you know, said, said they have a ton of volunteers, uh, they deal with burnout sometime, and uh, asked if the working group has um, considered uh, onboarding documentation or anything like that. Amy June has a thing. So I know one of the camps, I can't remember which one that I work with, maybe 
we put up a roles and responsibilities list up there for other people to take down. But also, mid pandemic we implement the buddy system, which you have to implement, you know, sooner than later, where we have a lead, and then we have someone who's new shadowing and buddying, and so there's a drug mm -hmm. redundancy factor. And then there's accountability, and there's all these things that come along with it. But the next year, the, that redundant person can slip into that leadership role, and then the leader can pick another section or whatever. So, but that buddy system has really, really helped at a couple of the camps. Yeah, yeah, so Amy June talked about um, Mid-camp, we have a, a, a list of our roles and responsibilities and also the buddy system so that for every volunteer lead, you have somebody backing them up that hopefully can take over the next year. So yeah, um, mid-camp, we, we have that. Uh, we've, we've, the, the group has definitely talked about documenting. Uh, on the documentation, there is um, a bunch of information about roles that have been kind of collected um, that, yeah, uh, uh, we can send you that link. Um, but yeah, doing more documentation is something that is, is absolutely in um, the list of things that we want to do. Um, and we'd love more help with that. And, and I can speak a little bit to the burnout piece. A number of years ago, um, um, all of my volunteers evaporated. And I was, I was doing the camp all on my own. And uh, um, at the end of it, um, I was exhausted, I was, I was messed up. And uh, we usually do at our at our monthly uh, meetup um, a, a retrospective of the camp. And I went in and I said, "Guys, if you do this to me again, there won't be a camp anymore. Like, you will never. I will not do this again." And you know, there was sort of this shocked look, right? Um, but the net result has been, um, you know, we've had anywhere from from seven to twelve volunteers at any given time since then. One of the other things that we've done that helps an awful lot is we've created a camp recipe, right? And basically that camp recipe is all the things that you need to do for the camp um, in order. And it, uh, it doesn't put in dates, but it says eight months before, you need to do this. Six months before the camp, you need to do this. And it just has a list of all of these different things. So this year we've got a brand new um, camp project manager. Um, who uh, she she uh, she's uh, she she works for Atten Design Group, and um, I handed the 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 uh, the, uh, the recipe over to her, and she just started writing up tickets, right? Um, and and uh, I think I think that if you do a combination of of um, uh, documenting roles and responsibilities, plus you've got a recipe, it puts you in a very good position where, I mean, I feel like I could walk away now if I had to, or if I wanted to, I don't want to, but, but I could, which is, which is really comforting, right? Like having that kind of succession plan, I think is really, really important. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Um, well, thanks folks. This has been amazing. Uh, we appreciate the questions and, and your time. Um, again, come to the BOF at 2.30, come to the table in the exhibit hall, join the event organizers, working group, Slack, uh, hit us all up and enjoy your future events. Yep, and thanks for all, thanks for running the camps. <laughs>